Although our union only affects graduate students at the moment, our getting the ball rolling and showing how students can come together to negotiate and to actually get what we request does influence other unions within the same campus and then unions throughout the U.S. because once they see what we were able to gain, I think that it's also likely for them to demand something similar. Welcome to the 81st episode of the Struggling Scientist podcast. We are a podcast by scientists, for scientists, anybody science adjacent, and perhaps even hobbyists. My name is Susanna, and I'm here with my co-host, Jaron. Hi. Today, we're diving into a topic that is sparking conversations at many universities. Unions for PhD students. In this episode, we'll explore what unions for PhD students could look like, the potential benefits, and the challenges they face. From better wages to improved working conditions and mental health support, we're covering it all. Whether you're knee deep in your thesis or just curious about the academic world, you won't want to miss this. So grab your favorite drink, get comfy, and let's get into it. Welcome to Stephanie and Andrew, our guest for today. Thanks for having us. Before we get started, we would like to get to know you a little bit better. Can you introduce yourselves? And what does our audience need to know about you? Maybe let's start with uh, Stephanie. Hi, I am Stephanie. I am a first year immunology student here at Johns Hopkins University. And you, Andrew? Uh, I'm Andrew. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Hopkins. Uh, I'm in a large umbrella program, but the research I do is in biophysics. So I've been here a bit longer and seen a lot. But uh, yeah, happy to be here and share more about how we got here. Yes, of course. Now, as European PhD students, I have to say the whole concept of unionizing is a little bit foreign to us, but luckily we have you two experts to explain uh, a lot about this today. And of course, also for our listeners from all around the world, I'm sure they're interested in how this exactly works. Now, before we get into the details, you both are very passionate about unions, but could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this? Yeah, I can start uh, as the 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 old one uh, in in the conversation. But uh, yeah, so I got involved near the end of my first year, which was four years ago. Wow, time flies. And I didn't really know that grad students can unionize when I came into grad school. It's not something you really think of as like part of the labor movement is grad students, uh, especially in the U.S., And so I found out through a friend of mine who invited me to a rally and then afterwards said, hey, there's a union meeting. Would you want to come? And I was like, oh, really? We can unionize. And she kind of brought me in. And it was just that close personal relationship that got me involved. Um, I went to that meeting and started to understand this as a path to start to address some of the conditions that we were facing. And this all came at the beginning of the COVID pandemic where we were um, essentially being told to go back to work without adequate support and safety precautions and no way to advocate for ourselves. And so it was sort of natural for me to to get involved when somebody provided this as a potential avenue to do that. Okay. Um, I started uh, organizing or started being a part of the union during one of my rotations when one of the grad student who was mentoring me is a part of it. She invited me to one of the School of Medicine meetings where there's a lot of conversation about how to get others involved and how to get people aware of what's going on. But prior to that, I actually come from a university, an undergrad that has a a graduate student union. And so when I was choosing my graduate program to join, I was definitely taking that into consideration. That was one of the advice I was given from other graduate students is to ensure I pick a university with a union. And I did see the benefits of a union in my undergrad as like some other grad students, when they've gone through difficult situations or when they felt like their program was not helping enough, that's when the union stepped in. And there was a lot of things that I thought were basic necessities that I thought every program would provide, but that was due to the union. And so I saw that big difference, the disparity between the things that I assumed everyone received right away versus what people our programs did offer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was really exciting because the union er, did not exist when I was applying. 
But when I came for interviews, everyone was excited that they were signing and voting for a union. So I was really excited. I did want to get involved right away. And just being mentored by the graduate student in one of my rotations just made that a reality since she showed me how to make time for both research and also to make time for being a part of the union because I do think that that's something that can hold a lot of people back is that everyone's here for research, um, but making some small sacrifices to be a part of the union can really benefit us. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I imagine that the whole situation surrounding PhD unions is not really something completely new. I think I imagine that there's quite a bit of history surrounding that. Can you tell us a little bit about that history? How did we end up in the current situation and why do PhD students need unions to happen? Yeah, I mean, I can, I'll, I'll give like a, a brief and somewhat more recent history. In, in the US, PhDA student mm-hmm. unions have existed for quite some time, but the ways in which the actual like negotiations uh, are governed has changed over time. Um, so there's some pretty old graduate student unions. University of Michigan is one of them. University of Iowa is another. So two public institutions in specific states. And those are governed through the state law. So if the state allows you to do it, then you can do it. For us, we're in Maryland, where our state doesn't actually allow collective bargaining of public sector workers. But for us, we are at a private university, and then that changes everything because we're governed by the federal law. And so for our purposes, we've had the the right to unionize since, um, and it's, it's changed multiple times, but we've been considered employees by the federal government since 2016 when they granted Columbia University the right to collectively bargain. So that was a like a three to one decision of this labor board that is appointed by whoever the president is. Um, and so that was when we were able to file for a union election. But then coming out of that is when the presidency changed, Donald Trump was elected and attempted to change the board and overturn the rule. So it actually, even after this decision, we weren't able to actually file because any graduate student union filing for a union election to certify could risk the ability for unions in the future to do that um, at these universities. And so we basically had to completely stop um, from 2016 until basically 2021. It just wasn't an option for us to use that process with the federal government because of the risk. Um, And so really it was a few years for all of these sort of unions that couldn't actually form legally, just advocating for the issues themselves, um, raising pressure on administration, doing rallies, doing like teach-ins, doing walkouts, et cetera. And then in 2021, when Biden replaced the board members and made it so that that rule wasn't at risk anymore, we were then able to unionize and that has caused a massive surge of PhD and uh, graduate student unions in the U.S. forming in the last year or so. Uh, I think it was like 14 formed in the last year. In the previous like 15 years, it had been 14 over that entire span. So it's a massive change given the current moment, given COVID really pushing people to understand themselves as providing labor to the universities as opposed to just being students. And this opportunity that everyone has seen what can happen when you come together and form a union. So that's sort of the brief history of how we got to this point. Um, But yeah, happy to talk more about it. Okay, very cool. I guess it also explains why we are now also in Europe hearing about unions being created by PhD students so much. Can you tell us a little bit about what that process looks like? How do you set up a union and what universities have them so far? Is that the majority or? Yeah, so um, I sort of mentioned how it depends on if you're a public or a private university. So unfortunately, there's no one standard on how this works. It depends on what state you're in and like the law, whether it permits it or not. And then additionally, what the process is, if it's permitted. And that's not to say like if it's not permitted that it doesn't happen where people form a union and start like trying to negotiate. It just means there's no like legal contract that binds it. Um, So really it all comes to the the workers coming together and deciding that they're going to, to change things. It's just which mechanism you use. 
for us at a private university, our process went from we have to prove that enough people that are eligible to be in this union want to have a, the chance to vote to be in one. So there's sort of a, a few different steps. The first step is you get people who are eligible to sign union cards. The card itself is basically a declaration that I, as a member of this uh, workplace, want to be want the opportunity to vote in a union election. Um, and so we collected that. Uh, the actual legal threshold is you need 30%, um, but we had over 60% when we filed our petition. So we already knew that we had more than a majority needed to win. We sent that to the labor board. They said, okay, here's your election date. And then we had to turn out people to the polls. This is run sort of, uh, as you might expect in the US, we have quite an archaic system with our government. And so it is paper ballots that you fill out in person. And there were there was a single voting location on each campus. And it was a total of, I think, 16 hours of voting, where over 2000 people cast their votes over those two days. And so it was really an effort of us getting everyone together to vote. Um, but the vote passed. And so when they counted it, it was 97% voted yes. And we then had a certified union and entered the, the negotiating process. So that's sort of the the short version of how that process works for the private universities and for all private workplaces in the U.S. That's the same uh, unionization process. Okay. So obviously, once all of this goes through, ideally, you will be able to have the negotiations for improved working conditions. Ideally, what would those negotiations sort of entail? Like, what would you like to see come out of this negotiation for PhD students and graduate students in general? And what what is actually realistic <laughs> as well? <laughs> yeah, so the going into the negotiations, it can it can look a lot of different ways. Every employer is different, every university is different, and so the way that they react can vary. Um, in our case, we were particularly bold, I think, in our demands, because our members decided that's what they wanted to do. Um, we value the work that we do. We think we should be valued by our employer and do some cutting edge, re edge research and should be compensated fairly for that. And so we went in pretty bold and the university sort of started by rejecting almost all the proposals on the first day. Um, and we went from there and it was a battle and we started negotiating a couple months after our um, union election and it took us about 11 months to settle our first contract, which we have done um, as of this point. As of like two weeks ago, we ratified our first contract. So our bargaining team said this is good enough, sent it to the members and our members ratified it. Um, so every member had a vote and they ratified it by a 99.5% margin. Um, so people were incredibly satisfied with where we ended up. And I think uh, there's some amount that we won things that people didn't think we would. And it's because we were bold in asking. So our average salary has increased significantly. So we have now a, a minimum uh, of 47,000 US dollars a year starting in July. Um, previously, the average salary was 33,000. Um that's a big so the yeah. average raise is is pretty significant. And there are some departments where their raise is actually like 80% because they were mm -hmm. so underpaid. So I know some people that were getting paid about 27 and are now going to get a $20,000 raise in July. So it's one thing we've won. Um, another a bit of uh, significant changes is the additional support for international workers. So people that come from outside the U.S., they're going to get support on how to file their taxes since the U.S. tax code is incredibly complicated and more complicated if you're not a citizen, as well as additional like financial support for renewing visas. And if you get stuck somewhere, you have a guaranteed leave. So let's say you have to go back to your home country to renew and you get stuck for some paperwork issue. You actually get additional time off that's paid to deal with the, the problem. And so these are some significant wins um, that not all grad unions have that we're really proud of and, and able to get significant support on. I don't know if you have anything to add. I just wanted to add that that was continuous work by our bargaining union so unit. So um, every month they would meet and they would go over the proposed contract and then they would go through the changes 
that the um, the other people, was the university, the, yeah, 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 the university <laughs> would then reject, and they would. Ten- it'd be a really, from what I've heard, it, it was a really tedious process that lasted hours, once a month, and then so after that, it would try to revise and resubmit each time, and so this was a process that took almost a year. And it was a really a huge goal to try and ratify a contract before the one year mark, mm-hmm. um, to ensure that it's a timely manner that w- after we have started a union. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds okay. like the bold strategy worked out uh, in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, very cool. Sounds like a lot of progress made. Um, were there any things that you would still like to see that weren't included that you think? Should perhaps it be in the next negotiations? I mean, I think there are definitely some places where we had to to take some concessions in order to secure the contract. It, the only way we secure more is if uh, enough people are willing to fight for it. And clearly the margin says that people were okay with this. Mm-hmm. But I think there are, there are definitely some fights for the next contracts. I think... Um, we got some support for for parents and caregivers who come in and need additional support, right? Childcare is incredibly expensive and supporting a family is very difficult. And that shouldn't preclude you from being able to do this kind of research and pursue an education. Um, and so, you know, we did win some direct cash subsidies. Um, so just like direct paycheck enhancements, your wage is just higher if you have a, a child. Um, but it's definitely not the amount we would like to see. It is something, and I think that we could win more in the next negotiation. And so I think that would make a big difference. And I'd also like to see us increase the amount of support for international workers um, in addition to that. I think something else that I think would be really important to implement would be a percent increase the longer a student is here. Because as a student um, is in grad school, they're learning more. They are mentoring first years or mentoring others. And so I think they should be properly compensated as well, like I know that they are in other universities. And so because they have more knowledge, because they have more experience, they do get paid more usually than the younger years. Okay. And what type of things do you actually use to to bargain with? What is kind of the the threat that you put out for the universities to accept this? (laughs) I mean, it's it's a variety of things. We've done a lot of different creative ways to disrupt the university. So we've done sort of a march. So our, our university mm-hmm. president has a house on one of the campuses. So we've marched to his house before to deliver sets of our demands. Uh, we've hosted large rallies outside of the bargaining room itself. Um, mm-hmm. So our bargaining team is up there with their bargaining team. And we're out front making so much noise, they actually took lunch early because of just how many people we were able to get out there. And so, I mean, I think the the implicit and then towards the end explicit threat uh, is that we could withhold our labor at any point and this university won't function. Um, mm-hmm. That's the ultimate tool that we have. And reminding them of that, especially in that last two months, was the reason we were able to get so many concessions. As we said, it took almost a year. Nine months of that was them stalling and trying to drag it out longer. And then as soon as we had 500 people uh, walk out to do a practice picket, so not actually striking, but just taking shifts and an hour at a time, people would walk out to the picket line. 500 people participated in that. And then the next session, they immediately conceded on things um, in a way we hadn't seen before. And so that reminder that we are really contributing the labor that lets this university function, that was the, the thing that we needed to to prove to them that you need to get serious about this negotiation and provide us the things that we're asking for because what we were what we were demanding was not unreasonable in any way. Um, we're asking for basic adequate support to do our jobs um, and do the research that we came here to do and do the teaching we came here to do. And if if they don't support that, then we're not going to be able to continue doing it. And so once we made that very clear, they understood that threat. And they they completely changed how they were treating us at the bargaining table. Nice. Okay. I have to say, um, stopping work to to for salary negotiations is also definitely something that happens in the Netherlands. So, uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, now these negotiations are specific for the contract of PhD students, but do they also (laughs) have consequences for the rest of academia, the postdocs and the professors, uh, perhaps even? 
Specifically, our union is grad student only. There are universities that include undergrads, but those are usually separate. So currently at Hopkins, there is um, a growing demand for the postdoc union. I think they just recently, did they recently have a vote on? No, they're they're still talking. They're still talking. The, the, the discussions are escalated now. <laughs> for postdocs <laughs> to start their own union as well. Mm-hmm. And so although our union only affects graduate students at the moment and PhD graduate students. It doesn't necessarily include master students. Our getting the ball rolling and showing how students can come together to negotiate and to actually get what we request does influence other unions within the same campus and then unions, I think, as well as throughout the U.S. because once they see what we were able to gain, I think that it's also likely for them to demand something similar Um, in the same way that we took ideas from other unions and what is appropriate to request. I love that. I also like the idea of just sort of by showcasing what techniques or what methods actually work to get the (laughs) results that also helps other unions also potentially get those results as well. So nice. So maybe sort of moving forward, what are sort of the next steps in the process of the whole PG union? Yeah, I mean, now that we have a contract, it's time to enforce it. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we enforce our own contract. Um, yes, there's a federal board that can resolve disputes, but they're not equipped or funded appropriately to do it on every dispute that we have over the contract language. And so part of what we want in our contract is a clear grievance procedure where we say, if the contract is violated, this is who you talk to at this step. If they can't fix it, you go up a step and so on and so forth. Um, and with the ultimate, if needed, an independent arbiter that would actually come in and make the decision. And so what we're really doing now is implementing the contract. So a lot of these things are going to take time for the university to implement for 3,000 plus members that we have in our union. Um And so we have to press them to get it done sooner instead of later, right? Like it's different to to have the support ahead of time than it is to get reimbursed for it later um, because the contract's in effect now. So yeah, we're really just trying to ensure that we can enforce this contract and start to teach people that come in who come in with the contract what it took to get here because we don't want people to be like, oh, well, now that there's a union, I'll have to get involved, right? Um, Complacency will not win us a better contract next time. And so- it's just trying to like pass on that knowledge of you know the senior people like me and the more junior people like Stephanie, um, who will still be here for the next negotiations, <laughs> uh, to be able to pass on that knowledge and say, you know what, it actually took a lot to get here and build that kind of culture that understands this is our contract, we're defending it, and we're going to improve on it next time around. I think another goal is also to ensure everyone knows the new benefits we do have and for them to take advantage of it and to be able to communicate that to as many grad students as possible because they should gain these um, benefits. But, you know, grad students are busy and so maybe they don't really know uh, everything that was gained besides maybe a few benefits that they were specifically looking at. Okay. Um, Well, we're already at the last part. (laughs) Where we um, we want to thank you so much for being a being a guest at our podcast. We uh, learned a lot about unions, and now we can be well informed, which we love, of course. If people would like to know more about you guys or find you somewhere or maybe learn more about unions, do you have any places where they can find you or more information? On Twitter X, so at True Hopkins, on Instagram at Teachers and Researchers United, and our website at TrueJChu.org. True okay. as in T R U. Perfect. Um, for our listeners, if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, you can reach out to our website via the strugglingscientist.com. You can also check out our website to sign up for the awesome Journal of the Struggling Scientist, uh, also known as our newsletter. And if you've enjoyed the episode, then leave us a rating on your favorite podcast platform as it helps us grow and reach more struggling scientists out there. And there are a lot, sadly. And you can follow us on social media. Jaden, which ones are those again? X, Instagram, Threads, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. And we hope to see you again next time. Bye. Bye.